Good afternoon and welcome to the Full Scottish on Sunday the 20th of June uh, 2021. My name's Maggie Lennon and a big shout out to all the dads out there because of course today is Father's Day. Before I introduce my guests I'll run through the up-to-date Covid statistics as of two o'clock yes, uh, today. Yesterday, sorry. Um, 1,209 newly confirmed cases of Covid-19 have been recorded in Scotland. Two new reported deaths of people who have tested positive. 3,611,266,000 people have received their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccination and 2,555,308,000 have received their second dose. At weekends, only statistics on new cases, deaths and vaccinations are updated. Since the start of the pandemic, a total of 253,120 people in Scotland have tested positive and 7,692 patients who have tested positive have sadly died. I'm delighted to welcome uh, to the programme today Linda Fabiani, Linda Fabiani, a regular on this programme, former MSP. And joining us from Wales today, this is the great thing about um, COVID, we can have guests from all over the country and from other countries, is Delis Jewell, who's a member of the Welsh Parliament from South Wales East. Welcome to you both. Now, despite the fact that we are entering or in the middle of what would appear to be a third wave of the virus, uh, the plans to suspend furlough, to stop furlough at the end of September seem to be going ahead. And from July, the amount that businesses will have to pay uh, towards their staff salary is going to increase. So from July, it's 70%. In August and September, it's up to 60%. And there's some concern that some employers will not be able to afford that or not be willing to pay it. So I'm wondering if either of you have had any indication uh, what you think might happen when furlough is suspended in terms of people not returning to work because basically the jobs are not there? Linda. Well, um, because I'm not an elected member anymore, I don't get the, the direct correspondence that I used to get. And every every time that there, there was an issue about changes to furlough, the, the inbox was just jammed full. What I have been doing is um, listening to some former colleagues who are highly highly concerned about it um because here we are in the third wave that everyone keeps talking about you know we've just heard restrict travel restrictions for example so we're not out of the woods yet it may well be uh, that further restrictions are put in place perhaps in local areas so it's far too soon to be winding this down i i really do think the uk government has to look at all aspects for business and part of that is extending a meaningful furlough scheme. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm not uh, elected, as I said, and I'm sure Delith will have been picking up much more stuff near the coalface. But, uh, you know, we could be heading for an absolute disaster with uh, people losing jobs, businesses going out of business, and, and to be building towards a recovery, uh, not making it really rock bottom. So yes, Delith, um, what are you picking up then from your part of Wales in terms of businesses that might not recover, might not reopen, staff that might be made redundant at the end of furlough? Well, I, I mean, I agree utterly with what Linda's been saying. It's going to be an, a disaster for so many, not just individual businesses, but I think entire sectors, if the furlough scheme is not extended. And let's just take a moment to, to step out of the question that we're even talking about. We're talking about, okay, well, inevitably it's going to come to an end because that's the, the Tories are obviously desperate to bring the Tafuro scheme to an end as soon as they can justify doing so. I mean, I think that during the pandemic, the kind of Tory fallacy that the free market will always sort everything out, that's been exposed for the fallacy that it is. If it hadn't been for state intervention, then society would have collapsed. And I, I agree with what Linda was just saying, that I mean, how could one not agree with, with that, that the furlough scheme should continue until there is no need for the furlough scheme. So I think that what some Tory government ministers have been saying recently, that implying that some people won't want to go back to work, I mean, that that is just nonsense. I, I'm picking up on 
so many people who are concerned, who are worried, who've got this uncertainty over uh, the future of their job. Employers, you know, small businesses who don't know whether they can give certainty to their staff. So yes, I, the the onus here has to be on the UK government to extend the furlough scheme until there's no need for it. We do in Wales also need to have some more certainty and clarity given by the Welsh Government in terms of the support schemes that are going to be made available to businesses in the interim. Of course, we shouldn't be in this uh, situation in the first place, but the Treasury holds the strings on this measure, of course, uh, and we are at the mercy of a Tory party that seems intent on bringing it to an end just to, to, to satisfy the economy, as though the economy doesn't depend on people having jobs. It just, it doesn't make sense to me. But it's it's sort of typical, isn't it? I mean, the government have been trying almost to second guess the virus the whole way through. I mean, this whole thing about setting this ridiculous day of tomorrow, originally, 21st of June, where it's all finished, masks off, everybody hug, everything's back to normal. Despite the fact the scientists were saying for months before that's a stupid thing to do and obviously they've now extended it. So it seems that every time the British government attempts to try and um, corral the virus into doing what they want it to do, surprise, surprise, the virus says we're not playing that game. So you're right. One would hope that if the third wave continues and the rate of infection continues to go up, although it doesn't appear to be making people as ill as it were, and the deaths are staying low, um, but people are not going back to work, that the furlough will continue. I just wondered, Linda, what you made of that comment by Andrea Leedson, that people on furlough had had a great time. It was great for some, and people didn't want to go back. They'd been growing vegetables and making bread, um, uh, patronising <laughs> or what, Linda? Well, I hadn't heard that before. That's a new one. I'll tell you what. There's the odd person here and there that may well have enjoyed furlough. And that'll be the odd person who's got a great garden, who's got a big house, uh, who can have a really good life, and who isn't really concerned about their job in the longer term and knows they're going to have a good pension and are going to have a job till they retire. That's fine, but they're few and far between. But for your very ordinary worker who's waking up every day in an ordinary house, um, who is getting bored rigid because they're not away blooming growing vegetables and baking bread. They're just worried sick about the future for their family. They're worried sick about not having a job at all and whether they'll ever get another one. That is the most patronising tosh that anyone could come out with. And it's either just a complete non-knowledge of how most folk live or it's a deliberate, I don't give a, um, uh, I don't give a monkeys. <laughs> and, uh, you know, something Dell had said earlier on really struck me, uh, which was when Dell had said the Tory government are determined to stop furlough as soon as they can justify it. Now, there's the thing. It cannot be justified in any way at the moment. Anybody with any knowledge knows that. But what the Tories are very good at doing is justifying to themselves and their supporters, and then trying to put it out there to convince everyone else and try and put it out as fact. And if Andrea Ledsom's coming out with that stuff, that's all part of the game they're playing to try and justify their own actions. I mean, I think the worrying thing is for a lot of businesses, the fact that they're now going to have to contribute more in order to keep the furlough scheme going. And that's the concern that if they can't afford to do that, um, and I mean, a lot of businesses didn't top up from the 80% and workers were not happy about it, but could survive on perhaps 80% of their salary. They didn't think it would be for so long. But if that gets reduced to 60%, then that becomes an issue. And I think that's the concern that people are actually made redundant because they, the, their companies can't afford the current furlough system. So this sliding scale, which is due to start um, very soon, 1st of July, is one of the concerns. So while furlough might be extended, the sliding scale, I think, is the issue. The other thing I find offensive about Leedsom's comments, well, actually, I find nearly everything that woman says is offensive, <laughs> but was the ignoring, ignoring people who've got serious mental health problems because of being mm. on furlough, with having nothing to do with being so uncertain. And I think that's a, a real concern. I noticed, I think that was the Labour Party have been pushing for the government to introduce legislation to allow people to work from home, that companies would almost have to make that part of their 
future contracts and the government have refused to do that. Dallas, do you think that's something that should be considered, that there should be now a requirement on companies to look at more flexible working? And could that be legislated for or is that a step too far? Oh, I don't think that's a step too far at all. I think what we need to do is to allow the flexibility to be able to not just work from home, but also to have more flexible hours so that people can fit it around uh, the realities of, of their lives. Um, but I think that there needs to be flexibility so that, for example, people are not forced to work from home if it takes too much of a toll on their mental health to work from home. We're all different. Some people work better from home. Other people really miss the office. In my own team, I've got people who really want to be able to work from home more for the future, and I'm really keen for them to be able to do that. But then other people who want there to be the option to go into the office. So I think there needs to be flexibility. We need to be looking at introducing hubs in town centres where people can work, not having to travel as far to commute into the office, but that there's a separate place from their living. I mean, not everyone has a room in their home that can be a dedicated study or workspace. Lots of people have to use a shared space for that. You know, if you're a couple and that you're both having to use it and someone has to use the kitchen table, if you've got young children, then it becomes impossible to be able to do something like that sustainably. So I think we need to have more flexibility. But I really agree with the, the point that you were making there about the uh, the absence of consideration for the mental health toll that the past year has taken on people. I think that there's been a kind, a kind of collective trauma uh, that, that has affected people in obviously very different ways and different circumstances will have exacerbated this for so many people. But we shouldn't take away from the fact that even for those of us at the beginning of the pandemic who were lucky enough to have outdoor space, it was, you know, you know, it, we, we didn't know it was going to go on for so long. So we were in a relatively comfortable situation. But if you don't have certainty about what's going to happen to your job and how you're going to provide for yourself or your family in the future, how can that not take a toll? So, so yeah, we need to recognise the trauma that this, ha this has had on uh, people, the traumatic experience. I think that we need to have more flexibility, not just in terms of where we work, but what hours we do and how it fits around our lives. I like this idea of hubs in city centres where people could perhaps hot desk. That might be one of the answers to what's happening on the high street with so many shops and companies going out of business. I mean, I was walking um, in Argyle Street the other day and I, I, and I was really shocked. I, I knew that Topshop had finished as a company. I hadn't realised that actually they'd stripped the building already. Obviously, the big Debenham store is closed and you think all of that space that might never be taken up again by retail, that might be an answer for local authorities to think about doing something smart with that. So, I mean, I know people are accuse me of always looking for the positive side of COVID. It, you know, every now and again, my po inner Pollyanna bursts forth and I, I want to think of silver linings. But, you know, we've got to take try and take some positives from that. So that might be. Um, you mentioned, Ellis, about uh, a recovery and it was quite interesting. An interesting story has just emerged this week that the voters of um, Chesham and Amersham who went to the polls with a by-election, which, of course, the Liberal Dem Democrats took the seat from the Tories. It had always been held by the Tories up until then. Apparently, were being bombarded with letters saying that um, there was a way to secure a future recovery and to guarantee economic recovery post-pandemic, but only with a Tory MP. So it would appear that, Delith, that rotten boroughs are alive and well. What did you make of that story? Well, yeah, they used to have to deal with rotten boroughs. Now we've got rotten Boris. I, I, I mean, <laughs> we've always known that the Tory party deals in pork barrel politics. It's just that until relatively recently, they weren't quite as blatant about it. I mean, yeah, so that letter that had, that's been making the rounds on social media that had gone from uh, the tre the, the, the from Rishi Sunak to mem to people living in Cheshire and Amersham, telling them basically, well, trying to bribe them and to say, if yeah. you vote, for the, the Tories, then you'll be able to um, have, you know, the, we'll invest in your communities. There was a link there with, with something that my team had uncovered in April uh, about the Community Renewal Fund. So one of the EU successor schemes, uh, the, the EU funding, uh, structural funds, benefited the area that I'm from. It benefited the valleys in Wales. And 
one of the communities that I represent, Caerphilly, has been left out of the priority areas for one of these EU successor schemes by the Tories, and we couldn't work out why this would be when it looked like lots of the areas that had been prioritised were Tory party areas, especially in England. And we thought, well, what's this? So my team looked into it. And of the 100 areas that have been prioritised, 35 of them should have scored lower than this area that has been left out in, in my region. And we thought, well, why have these 35 areas that should have been left out been prioritised? Well, 22 of them have Conservative MPs, 10 of them are red wall seats that the Tories are prioritising for their own means, and eight of them are the seats of Tory party ministers. I mean, you couldn't get more blatant about them trying to enrich their own interests rather than our communities. And like I say, I think we've always known that this is the Tory bent, then this is their tendency, but I just can't believe that they're being quite so blatant. They cannot be allowed to get away with this. Yeah, except that they probably can get away with it because they've got a big majority and they're still something like 16 percentage points ahead in the polls. But the Community Renewal Fund, as you say, is one of the EU successors. Um, I don't think yet we know, Linda, do we, how that's going to play out in Scotland? And am I right in thinking, and this may be another fund that I'm getting confused with, but is this the fund that we're having a bit of a, a trial run at before it actually comes in officially in 2023? Or is that another fund? Maybe one of you can. Well, clear that I don't up know. Maybe me. Dallas will know the detail of that, but I know because I, I was involved. Obviously, I still have a, a great care for East Kilbride that I used to represent and uh, you know, potential projects put together for, for the fund. So I know that the, the entry date, the submission dates were Friday, just Friday there. Uh, and, and we'll see how that pans out. But I mean, I. I generally have concerns about, you know, what they're putting in place. Obviously, the big picture, uh, I'm a Europhile. We should never have left, left Europe in the first place, as far as I'm concerned. So they're scrabbling about trying to pretend that things will be just as good and nobody will miss out. And they've put these schemes in place. What really bothers me about it is the way that they completely bypass democracy. Um, because the Scottish government has nothing to do with it. It's direct Westminster. Um, they, when you look at the, the rhetoric round about it and when you look at the guidelines, it's Westminster MPs um, who seem to have a, a big say in it. Um, and that, so they're also trying to do that divide and rule thing because Scotland, of course, it's mostly SNP MPs. I'm glad to say that uh, I understand that most of them aren't falling for the nonsense of it, but they're trying to bypass the Scottish government. They're trying to put a division in there. And uh, also they're bypassing local democracy because it's local authorities that should decide what's best for their areas, uh, not somebody sitting in London. And because of the speed that it's had to be done as well, I'm not convinced that uh, local, local councillors have had enough time to properly put together what's best for their area as a whole. So I, I think there's a lot of uh, gerrymandering, so to speak, uh, going on there, which, it as Deborah out, says, has it, it been the Tory way. It came out early on that it was certainly going to be the case that the new fund would not be administered um, by the devolved country, so that the Scottish Government probably wouldn't administer the fund in Scotland. I'm not sure who administers ESF funding in Wales. I'm not sure if it's the Welsh Government or whether it's a another organisation, but the idea was that it was going to be held centrally. And that did feel very much like a political move on behalf of the Westminster government. So um, obviously Wales, sadly, um, voted to leave the EU. Um, are, are you worried, Della, um, like Linda, that this is going to, obviously you've, you've mentioned your own area, one of the areas you represent has been missed out. Are you worried that if there's not an input from Wales in some form, whether from the government or other agencies, that the, the funding won't be targeted at the right parts of the country. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm not I'm not just worried about it. I'm furious. Uh, I mean, the I have absolutely no faith that the Tory government in Westminster will want to actually help the communities that the EU funds actually used to help. I mean, one of the wonderful things about the EU that is so missing from Westminster is that there was a mechanism and there is still a mechanism with the EU to, to, to make sure that wealth is distributed according to need. And that just seems anathema to the Westminster 
system. That's just not how they work. So I was always concerned uh, about what was going to happen after we actually left the EU. But the and I have been increasingly I, I don't know quite what the word is for how dismayed I am with how the Tories have decided instead of trying to uh, find a way of making sure that we have the least damaging possible Brexit because Brexit is always going to be damaging but the, instead of making sure that it actually is the least damaging that it could be they just seem to want to they use this phrase of leveling up they just want to get more power for Westminster and they want to undermine devolution so whether it's these different leveling up funds as they call them or whether it's the uh, the, the legislation that's actually the Internal Markets Act that's going through that bypasses the Scottish and Welsh governments that means that they can try and build roads in Wales even though it's a devolved area and all sorts of things like that. I mean, they seem to want to, s they see this means of aggrandizing their own interests. Uh, they just really cynically, that they're just going to use these funds as they see fit. And it's not just that they want to be able to it's not just actually, I'll correct what I just said, it's not that they want to use the funds themselves and that they think they know better. I don't think they're even going to pretend that they're using these funds to help communities. They want these communities to think that the Westminster system is better and more important to them than the devolved institutions. That is their only interest. And I mean, you're saying that they're going to get away with it because of the majority that they have. Who knows? Maybe this... Uh, crack in the blue wall, uh, as they're saying that the, the Cheshire and Amersham, uh, <laughs> the Cheshire and Amersham result is, can they continue doing this? I mean, we all have a voice. I'm deeply concerned about the way in which this is going to affect Wales. I mean, I'm, I'm, you in Scotland obviously have a government that is looking out for Scottish interests. The Welsh government still needs to actually blatantly show how much the union is damaging our interests as a nation. Uh, they are far closer to doing that than uh, the, the Labour Party in Scotland, but they're not there yet. Yeah. And I mean, because the, the drive for self-determination or for unity in Ireland is um, built around people who supported Europe and didn't want to leave Europe, you can see why the the ultimate result of Brexit is to use that as a way to promote the union. And we should have seen it coming. Um, we laughed when they just wanted to slap union jacks and union flags and everything and fly them from buildings. But actually, it's, it's much more insidious. Um, do you think, Linda, that this is a crack in the blue wall? I mean, that stunt of Ed Davey and his little hammer, I must admit, was kind of painful to watch. Um, do you think this by-election does actually mean anything or is it just a protest vote? It was about planning regulations apparently, plus the turnout was very low. Is it something the Tories should be worried about or the rest of us should get any hope from? Oh gosh, um, I wish I could channel my inner Pollyanna like you Maggie, <laughs> um, but it just seems we've been here before and the Lib Dems, they make these breakthroughs every now and then and then they do stupid things like stand where we hammer, you know. <laughs> and it's all part of them not being taken that seriously. And I, I think I'm as much concerned about the opposition in Westminster as I am about the Westminster government. And, and I'm as angry about the, the opposition in Westminster as I am angry about the Westminster government. They're all just making a total um, codswallop of it. Uh, there's no real opposition. There's a government there that's just been allowed to run free. And every so often, you will get a crack in the wall. Uh, you will get a protest vote. But I think the main problem down there is that people are not seeing a real alternative. They can see a protest vote every now and then. But when it comes to the big day, uh, where the decisions have to be taken about who's you know going to run the UK and ergo England, um, there's not an awful lot of choice there. The demonstrations yeah. do have a choice. Yeah. Sadly, the bulk of the UK population, which is England, doesn't appear to have much of a choice at the moment. And that is very, very sad. Nor it would appear no how any way to get that 
extra voice. There's, there's no suggestion that there's going to be any breakaway parties that are going to, to help that. But then and with the first past the post system, then there really isn't <laughs> any opportunity. Um, I, I want to move on. There's another story that um, uh, broke this week um, by a UK doctor working in the health service in England. I don't know. We don't know which hospital or which hospital uh, or which um, NHS area he was talking about. His name is Zesham Qureshi and he un was uncovering the ridiculous position where some parents of a severely ill child with a very rare metabolic disorder were refusing point blank to have their child treated by anyone except a white doctor. It's called white led care. Um, it's, an it's an established practice in some parts of the world that we know about. And the hospital that the child was linked to agreed to this and allowed um, uh, extraordinary measures to have only white doctors treat this child, even though the child's life was put at risk. After about a year of this, they admitted it wasn't fair and they should stop it. But it's an appalling thing to have happened. And what does that say, Delis, to the huge number of ethnic minority clinical staff working in the NHS across the UK? I mean, what an absolutely appalling, like you say, appalling, just devastating thing to have happened that this was allowed. I mean, we, we know that uh, and, and we have to challenge the, 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 these racist, not just undertones. I mean, this is a very blatant racism. We have to challenge that when it comes out. But we know that this, it, that these awful thoughts and these awful uh, feelings do still exist in society. The, the, the past year has had far too many reminders of that really terrible fact. But the but the the, the greater evil here, and I think it was quite an, a, a quietly evil thing actually, was that the hospital in this case allegedly had agreed to kind of allow this racism to, to dictate the care that was given to a very sick child. I mean, we in the UK for many different reasons rely on so many wonderful almost miraculous immigrants who keep our health system going from doctors to nurses to the people who clean the hospitals to the you know our NHS would not survive if it were not for people who were born in other countries let alone people who were born in this country who are from, who have different racial makeups or who have di different family stories or, or different colors skin i mean one of the one of the leveling uh, factors in life is that we will all need care that we will all need to be supported when we are unwell i mean thank god that we have doctors and paramedics and nurses who were there i just can't believe that a hospital will have allowed the the, the quality of that kit to, to, to in any way be dictated by such a ridiculously ugly and damaging idea that it has to be people of a particular ethnicity i mean i i i i think that it has to come out which hospital this was and they have there has to be action taken to, to to me i mean thank god that this has actually come out at least on social media but i, I i'm just i'm struggling to find words to, to be honest i think to, to i mean i, I think i can't I, I, I agree i think the hospital needs named and shamed because not only did they go along with it they actually reportedly at meetings claimed it was an exemplary example of patient-led care which is appalling and obviously we don't know if it's happening elsewhere in the UK and, and and you're right we do need to know what do you think Linda should happen to the hospital or the the, the people that run the hospital who allowed this mm. to go ahead what should be the appropriate um, response well I am um, like Della like you Maggie like any reasonable thinking person I uh, was disgusted and stunned by this story and I found it quite hard to believe when I was reading it um, more about the uh, the actions of, of the hospital and everything else. What I tried to do, once I got over the initial anger, I tried very, very hard to go through it step by step and try to apply a degree of logic, perhaps some understanding, uh, which was hard, to any of it. So I tried to imagine a very ill child with racist parents uh, coming into the hospital. And if it was an emergency and the hospital said, yes, okay, if you won't let us treat your child and 
We don't have time to go to court and everything you have to do if parents don't allow a child to be treated. Um, we will, in this emergency situation, have a white doctor. I could almost get my head around that for the sake of the child, even though it was wrong. But then to embed that into a system that says that will be allowed from then on for that care is just not acceptable in any way. And to then hold it up as an exemplar of person-centred care is just so much worse and just absolutely not acceptable in this day and age. So I'm trying to apply the same logic as to what should happen to those that allowed this to become women in their hospital. Um, I'm verging between sacking them all uh, or sacking those at the top uh, and also saying, let's be logical, let's be sensible and let's make sure this never happens again. Complete retraining of all these people is necessary in terms of anti-racism, in terms of hate crime, in terms of the Equalities Act. And I have heard it said, wait a minute, uh, race is a protected characteristic and women are allowed to demand a female doctor. Come on, only in very specific and very certain circumstances. There is no comparison to any of that. This goes against everything that we're supposed to stand for in Scotland, in Wales, in the UK generally. So I think we have to keep cool heads, we have to be clear, and the most important thing of all is make sure this never happens again. And that indeed, if it's happening elsewhere, it's stopped forthwith. I'm, I'm not aware of whether the BMA, um, British Medical Association, or indeed the GMC, who the registry body for medics um, in the UK, mm -hmm. have made any comment, but I would think that there's a role for them to play the yeah. BMA, I imagine, yeah. being effective with the union uh, for medical practitioners, for doctors, would be pretty annoyed about it. And, and I think the GMC mm. have a, a role to play. Moving on to something a little bit, um, uh, a bit, bit good news um, to do with racism, if there's such a thing, is that this week, uh, Joe Biden has made Juneteenth, which is the um, national, if you like, celebration of the emancipation of enslaved African Americans, which happens on the 19th of June, he's made it a federal holiday. It's the first time a new federal holiday has been introduced in the States for about 30 or 40 years since Martin Luther King Day was um, inaugurated as a federal holiday. I believe South Dakota, for some reason, isn't prepared to play. I don't know how they'll get away with that. Um, obviously, that's good news. Um, but in the context of George Floyd and Black Lives Matter, Delith, um, do you think some people will think it's it's a little too late or it's the, the, the kind of shine has been taken off of this? Because as we know, and we've covered on this programme many times, the um, instances of black Americans still being unfairly treated by the police, for example, is continuing. Yeah, a very belated happy Juneteenth uh, to you. I mean, obviously this, it is... It's a symbolic uh, thing to have a, a national day uh, of any uh, nature, but symbolism does matter. So, I mean, it can't be seen as a negative, certainly. I think that it, it, it's something to celebrate. In terms of whether it's too little too late, there is this wonderful quotation from uh, the American poet Langston Hughes that I often think about in, in questions like this. And he said, I am so tired of waiting for the world to become good and beautiful and kind. I mean, he was talking about the civil rights movement uh, largely when, when he wrote that. And we can't just wait for these good things to come about in life, for, for, the, for the ills and the injustices that are baked into the way that our society functions, for them to just disappear. We have to take positive action. So yes, a day like Juneteenth, a celebration is important, but that has to be part of something far wider and I think it does link in with the last topic that we were talking about in terms of racism in a, a hospital somewhere in the UK that actually what we need to do is back up these celebrations and things like that with education and picking up on what Linda was saying in terms of the training with the last question we need to be making sure on both sides of the Atlantic that actually we tell the stories of racism of slavery and um, we that we also tell the really 
good stories in terms of how different cultures have enriched our societies and that we find things to celebrate but we don't just focus on the negative stories about how uh, different peoples have been oppressed it is so fundamentally important that we do tell those stories and from the perspective of those peoples uh, and so this is this is a really important marker but that has to be part of a wider change in curriculums across the world i think in terms of the stories that we tell uh, and that we are enriched by these different stories that we have all been impoverished by things like slavery as well. Yes, okay, that we have um, in a monetary way that too many of us ha as a society have benefited from the proceeds of slavery, but that in a far more far more fundamental way we've been impoverished by it. We have to teach those lessons or else we will just keep on seeing more injustices happening and people dying because of the colour of their skin. Mm. On the subject of injustices, you would have thought, um, Linda, that perhaps the world had realised that if you attempt to keep down 52% of the population, that's women in the world, and treat them in a manner which keeps them, um, the old Glasgow Union debating motion, pregnant, barefoot and in the kitchen, for example, isn't the way to carry on. And yet this week, the World Health Organization of all people have published their draft global action plan. And one of the things in that is that they are suggesting in an almost biblical manner that women of childbearing age should not be allowed to drink alcohol. Now, this seems to me straight out of Gilead. Um, this is defining women by their wombs and their fertility and is utterly appalling. Or am I, am I overreacting, Linda? No, you're not overreacting. <laughs> you're certainly not overreacting. I, I haven't read the actual paper that this came out in. I don't know if the, the baseline for this was something like... Uh, it's always better if someone who's pregnant or whatever does not have a, an alcohol thing going on. And that other people have taken that and reported it as something very different. But uh, I don't care whether it's reporting it badly or whether it comes directly from, from the WHO. What a piece of absolute nonsense. And it is something straight from Gilead. But um, even though we're not in Gilead, uh, there are those in society uh, who would think that was a good idea. Uh, so we have to fight against that stuff completely. And we we have to be um, quite vocal about it. I mean, if we have any politicians in this country starting to come out with that nonsense, uh, I think we really have to fight back very hard because we cannot allow that kind of thing to take hold. I've got an ongoing concern, I have to say, um, as a feminist about a bit of a pushback on feminism and making it pejorative um, and it's almost as if we've, we've just got too mouthy and uh, too successful and there's an element there wanting to push back in it. So anything like that at all, uh, we, we just should not tolerate in any way whatsoever. That, that's fair, isn't it, Jillis? This isn't about women's health. This is actually about a backlash. This is saying we want modest women who are well behaved. Um, we all, I'm sure we've all got the t-shirt saying that you know, well-behaved women don't achieve anything. And I think that's true. <laughs> um, but this this really can't stand. This is misogyny on steroids. Um, and also, does it not point take the point... I, I think there's been massive amount of research done on the impact of alcohol on uh, pregnant women and people attempting to have children. Is that the alcohol intake of the partner, the male partner, is just as important. But there's no suggestion here that men should stay off the booze if they're hoping to have kids. It's all, as ever, back on the backs of the women. Exactly. And and as it's being reported, and I take that the, the caveats that, that, that Linda was putting in there, that we need to be, because I also haven't read the actual study. I've seen the, the reports of it. But, I mean, from the way it, the headlines are talking about it, and, and even the write-ups, they're not talking about women who are trying to get pregnant. They're talking about women of childbearing age, which is a massive age group. I mean, I think it links in as well with the way, I mean, obviously it links in with the ways in which society still, as you put it, still 
defines women by their wombs. Uh, that I think that's a really good way of putting it, actually. I saw something, this, there was a thread on Twitter that a journalist had put up the point that was linked to this, but it, it, it made a really other troubling observation. I'd be really interested to hear what you both think about this. The point was made that childbirth is still one of the only, if not the only, uh, medical procedure where women are encouraged and are praised if they don't have um, any kind of drugs or anything like that to, to ease pain that, that you're trying to say that actually that oh gosh and they did it without any gas and air or anything i mean the reason that women in the first place one of the reasons that women were not given pain relief for such a long time was because there was this kind of really fundamental belief in society that women had to suffer and had to go through pain i mean like you say it's biblical why on earth is it that we reward women who've not had to have any drugs to go through childbirth? It's a major thing. I mean, it's one of the most painful things in the world. But, you know, you'd never ask men to go through kind of a major surgery or, or any kind of procedure like that without having pain relief. So I think it's all linked in. The fact that women are seen that our obligation is to have children. And by the way, you need to do it in certain ways. You need to behave in certain ways, too. It is biblical. Yes, and it's also ignoring the fact that not everyone wants to have a child or can have a child. It's just discerning that if you're a female and you have a womb, therefore you're, you know, you might at some point produce, and therefore you mustn't contaminate yourself. Um, and yeah, it, it is unbelievable. Um, Barbara Ellen in the Guardian is as ever brilliant on this um subject, and the comment I liked best was she said, "Let's be honest, in the UK, if it wasn't for alcohol anyway, who the hell would be having sex?" And I think she possibly has a point there. Um, so. World Health Organization, just in case you're wondering, this is judgmental, sexist, patriarchy on steroids, misogynist, and it will not stand. Um, women are not there to be dictated to on their behavior and stop trying to hide it under the issue of health. Um, moving over to Northern Ireland now, um, the continuing saga of who is running the DUP continues. A mere 21 days ago, Edwin Poots was elected as leader of the DUP when they decided to split the post of leader and first minister. Um, he has resigned after these 21 days, after yet another internal party row. This time, it's about the timetable to bring forward the legislation for the Irish Language Act. So Westminster had said if they couldn't sort this out, this was the reason, one of the reasons that the power sharing agreement collapsed. If they couldn't sort this out, they would impose a timetable. So Edwin Poots said, right, we'll get the timetable sorted. And as a result, he was then able to nominate um, the First Minister, Paul Gervin, and Sinn Féin were able to nominate Michelle O'Neill as Deputy First Minister. And it's all fine. But the rank and file of the DUP aren't they happy and Edwin Poots is out. There's a suggestion that because he has appointed Paul Gervin as First Minister, that Paul Gervin will also have to stand down. But I'm not I'm not sure if that's going to happen. So I, I don't know whether you've been following this, Delith. Um, uh, obviously, language and nationalism and culture is something that Wales and Ireland share in a way that Scotland kind of doesn't. And we'll maybe talk about the whole attitude to Gaelic and Scots in a second. But... Um, I've always been hugely impressed about the importance of the Welsh language in Wales, um, driven, I think, originally not necessarily by nationalism, but in communities that were working class and labour supported. So how, what's your feeling about what's been happening about the Irish language legislation over in Ireland and about this latest debacle? So we... I, I suppose for me, as someone who's Welsh and for whom the language is really important, it's a really important part of my identity, I find it really bewildering and sad and angering that there are politicians on the unionist side who are willing to, to, to risk at least bringing an end to power sharing. They're willing to risk the end to stability in Northern Ireland. And the reason for doing that is so because they want to deny people the right to be able to learn and to speak their own language. I mean, th there's a really ugly history, unfortunately, in Northern Ireland of politicizing the language, of, uh, which 
centuries earlier did happen in Wales, of course, of course, and trying to deny people the right to learn it. But what I find, this is just an alien concept to me, because languages open windows onto other worlds. They allow us to, and this is one, again one of the ways in which um, being a European is a really important part of my identity too, you know, that, that we can, when you learn another language, you can find out things about that, that, that culture's way of looking on the world. I mean, it should be building bridges. They should be things in which we all delight. I can't understand why anyone would want to diminish people's horizons so much. And they're talking about your own national language, your history with your past. I mean, people learning Irish will never not speak English because of the global world that we have. English is always going to be a part of life in Ireland as well. People aren't saying don't teach people English. They're just saying let them learn about their culture as well. I just find it deeply sad. I mean, thank goodness by now in Wales, it's still, it, you know, it, it, it's we've got further uh, of a way to go. But people like my mother, for example, who who is not taught Welsh by her parents, she still thinks that the language and she believes the language enriches her life. And it's something that belongs to her, even though she doesn't speak it. But we're talking about people here being denied again the right to speak it. It just seems barbaric to me. It really seems barbaric. Plus, I, I'm not sure about this, but one of the things that's going to happen is there's going to be an office of identity and cultural expression created in which both the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister will appoint who runs it. But I think it also is to cover Ulster Scots, which is the language of the unionist side. So I, I kind of don't understand. It's not just about Irish language. It's also about Ulster Scots, it's about the indigenous languages of that part of Ireland. Um, but it is, as you say, all about repression, isn't it? So Welsh was repressed, obviously Irish has been repressed. But Gaelic was repressed, Linda, by um, uh, London after the clearances. And yet we never in Scotland have had this same, partly because it's been literally pushed to the peripheries. We've never had that same cultural identity, I don't think, with Gaelic. So I'm a Dundonian. I'm a, a working class lowland eastern Scot. And certainly Gaelic was never part of my upbringing. I believe for a long time Gaelic was never spoken in that part of Scotland. And of course that was wrong. And so we've never really had the same connection with language. It doesn't really underpin moves towards self-identification. Why do you think that is? Or am I wrong? Maybe I'm wrong. I, no, I, I, don't, think, I, I don't think you're completely wrong. But I, I think there's been a, a lot of repressed uh, facts uh, about our language because... It's not just the Gaelic language in Scotland, there's also Scots. And uh, I mean, Scots wasn't suppressed um, legislatively the way that Gaelic was. Um, however, there's always been the cringe about Scots for years and years and years. I mean, my generation certainly, um, I wasn't allowed to use Scots words at home, even though my, uh, my mum and, and others were, were very Scottish. Um, because it was felt it was slang and there was an aspiration that you would speak the Queen's English. And I, I remember getting into trouble for using certain words and things. Thankfully, that's not the case anymore. You know, children in primary school now get taught Scots poems, just the annual burn stuff, but um, Scots in general. And, you know, folk like Billy Kay and others uh, have really pushed our, um, our Scots language and you know, you've got the Doric and, and uh, different aspects of it. However, there's still an element in Scotland that ridicules that. And uh, you see it in social media a lot because there's a few young people now who are publishing social media poems and recitations in Scots who get roundly hammered uh, by the same people who will vent about Gaelic road signs, for example. So we do still have an element of that. When you take it over to the north of Ireland, what you have there is a very political element. And the reason the DUP and other unionists aren't so much against Ulster Scots is because they don't see the Ulster Scots as a threat to the north of Ireland as part of the UK. And that's, that's what it's all about there. They see the Irish language as a potential down the road to a united Ireland. And you have those in the DUP uh, members 
who actually don't give a, a toss about uh, the devolution settlement and power sharing and everything in the north of Ireland. They just want Ulster, as they see it, to be part of the UK. Direct rule would suit them fine. So there's all these elements going on in Northern Ireland that are beyond what's in Scotland. We have it in small ways in Scotland, and unfortunately, it manifests itself mostly around the orange walk season and things. Um, but in the north, the north of Ireland, I mean, Delith and I um, served together on um, the British Irish Parliamentary Assembly, where we met people from all different. Uh, aspects of uh, Irish and Northern Irish politics. And even after years and years of politics, I was still taken aback by some of the attitudes that I saw at these fora. And I'm sure Delith was too. She's so much younger than me, so it'd be even more of a shock to Delith, uh, you know, not having direct memories of the troubles, etc. But oh boy, oh boy, it's still there. And uh, I'm pretty sure that the trouble in the DUP is a direct manifestation of uh, Northern Ireland as part of Ireland or part of the UK. I think it's also reflecting some fracturing of, of, of states and views within the unionist community um, in the north of Ireland. I, I think there's some evidence of that. Sticking with the idea of United yeah. Ireland for a second, Leo Vradiker has upset the British government by saying that he thought that there would be a United Ireland in his lifetime. Well, he's quite a young man. I don't doubt he's absolutely right. <laughs> he was basically told by the British government he'd no right to say that. It's as if Westminster hasn't really got their head around the fact that the Republic of Ireland is an independent, separate country. I mean, that came out with the whole Brexit thing where someone suggested, I believe quite genuinely, that the whole, the whole issue around the Irish border would be solved if Ireland would just agree to rejoin the UK. They've never accepted this. And for them to say this to Vradiker was outrageous. Tell us, well, his response and the response from his party has been pretty damning and quite funny. But, you know, what what, what should he have said? I mean, <laughs> I mean again, I'm, I'm slightly speechless about it because I think that the colonialist mindset in the people who govern the UK um, is it comes out so blatantly at times like this, uh, that just the I don't know that the, the, the I don't know whether they genuinely think that Ireland is just a slightly special case or something. I mean, this I think that so much of the Brexit negotiations must. I mean, logically, it must have been built upon some kind of assumption somewhere in their minds that Ireland would just sort itself out, that that they wouldn't let it become an issue because Ireland are. Oh, they're still with us, really. I mean, for goodness sake, how long has it been? Hundred and yet, years. I, think that, I mean, well, quite. I mean, I think that there is just this arrogance that had again manifested itself so many times in in the way in which different Tory politicians from England talked about the Northern Ireland border problem and just saying, oh, well, you know, it's no different. I think was it Boris Johnson who said it's no different from the border between two London boroughs. I mean. They, they just fundamentally that it's partly that they don't get it and also i think it's willful blindness about it that they just want to believe that ireland isn't quite the same it isn't totally a republic i mean yes it is there's so many manifestations of why that is the case but i mean i think i, I, I think it's i think it's, I think I it's that, that britain just assumed that ireland would change its mind and after a wee while chap the door and say can we get back in but if you look at, there hasn't been a single country that has seceded from Britain that has actually asked to go back. Um, uh, but, you know, as you say, Ireland's a special case as far as they're concerned. It does make the government look even more ridiculous. Um, we'll finish the programme, though, back at home here in Scotland with the news that Mike Russell has been named the head of the SNP Independence Unit. Now, Linda, I know you're not a serving MSP anymore, but you must know a lot about this. What is that actually going to mean? What is Mike's um, remit going to be? And is this a sign that we are firing the gun? We're on the starting line to have a kind of Olympic type theme there. Um, 
What, what's the what's the takeaway from this? Well, um, first of all, I didn't know this was happening. I mean, I, I only learned this uh, last night, same time everyone else did. What I would say is, you know, let's set the context here. The SNP has always been about independence, despite all the the words we're hearing from lots of different uh, quarters. There has never been a time when the SNP has not been campaigning for independence, and everybody knows what the SNP stands for. Nicola Sturgeon, as a leader, has been campaigning for independence for most of her life and for as long as I have known her. Um, she also happens to be First Minister uh, of, of a country and, and has to be running it through a pandemic. So there, there's the context. Um, we had a, a manifesto commitment uh, you know, for another independence referendum. Uh, so quite clearly, uh, we have to meet that, that manifesto commitment and take steps to get there. So. Mike Russell, of course, was a cabinet secretary in the government before he retired. Same time, he, he introduced a referendum bill in the last parliament, and that will now be taken forward, I presume, by Angus Robertson. Um, so, Mike, who used to be chief exec of, of the SNP, that was when I first knew him all these decades ago, um, is now charged with heading up the independence unit. I don't think for a minute that it means he's going to be sitting at a desk in HQ five days a week. What it means is that uh, he is going to be across the country coordinating our moves and everything that happens toward the next referendum. Uh, I mean, I, I think that's a, a great appointment. Mike is so smart, so knowledgeable, so well respected. He's the ideal person for this. I think he'll probably, and I'm speculating, he'll probably set out by putting a team round about him of folk that he can trust to be doing the same, that will work very closely with him as a team to make sure that we are out there with the SNP membership and listening and taking actions, but also to the wider independence and yes movement, so that when we come to the referendum and the referendum bill goes through and we get that set up, we have a very coordinated approach for a yes vote. because. Let's not kid ourselves on. We have to win this referendum. It's absolutely crucial for Scotland. And we cannot be rushing into things. We cannot be taking votes for granted, especially in the situation we're in just now. Mike's clear-headed, smart, and I think it's a great appointment. Thanks, Andy. Well, we're almost at the end of the programme, and we've had so much to talk about today, we haven't had much time to talk about the football. What a shame. <laughs> However, Wales are doing extremely well. I think you're playing Italy tonight. Is that right, Dylan? And am I right yeah. in thinking um, that if you draw, <laughs> you're likely to go through, but if you win, if you beat Italy, you'll be top of the table? See, I do know something about football. Um, yeah. <laughs> so how are, how, how are you feeling uh, in Wales today about this pending uh, game? Is that, uh, five o'clock, I think it's. You start five o'clock. Yeah, what's the feeling? Because Italy, Italy are the favourites to win. You know, they are. The I mean, the whole win. tournament, not just this match. Yes, yeah, yeah, certainly. I mean, we're feeling really buoyant because, um, with the way that the different scoring systems work, that 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 actually, I think that even if we were not to uh, win or to draw, we we still have a very good chance of going through to the next round. So please, I really hope obviously that we do win or draw but you know actually there has been such oh gosh we can all do with feeling something to feel positively about can't win something to feel hopeful about so actually football this summer has been something which has inspired so many of us even though we're watching from our screens maybe not being able to actually be in person in these games Oh, I think that the Wales football team, they are truly inspirational. I come from a part of Wales where rugby is far more uh, the the sport of choice than football, although I will say my claim to fame, Aaron Ramsey was a few years younger than me in the same school, and he was brilliant at football then. So I wish them all the best of luck. Well, obviously things are not really clear what's going to happen to Scotland, but according, according to lots of my friends on Facebook, heavens, a draw was even better than a win against England. God knows how that works out. And sadly, we are still, and I got into a lot of stick on social media about this, but I don't really care. Um, we are still hampered by the attitude that at least England didn't beat us or at least England didn't score. Um, and to me, it's, you know, I don't believe in the playing fields of Eton. I don't believe play up and play the game. For me, it's all about the win, and we didn't. We need to win the next game. 
Um, and if we don't, well, it will be an early bath for Scotland once again, which isn't to take away from what I will admit was an extraordinarily good performance by the Scottish team. It was just the attitude of the fans that upset me. But there you go. As I say, I was getting stick on social media for it. I don't care. Anyway, thank you very much for joining me um, today. Uh, and those of you who, who get us on catch up, just to remind you, as we always do at the end of the programme, that it takes money to put these programmes together. We have an extremely professional outfit here in Glasgow and we want to do more. We've got great plans for further scheduling. So please go online to broadcastingscotland.scot forward slash register and see what you can do about helping make a donation and supporting us. We have lost a few supporters over the last month. It may be COVID, it may be other reasons. So we really do need your support to continue. We want to be able to employ people to work on the programme because at the moment most people who are working for the, the channel are doing it in their own free time. Happy to do so obviously but it would be good if we could make this um, a, a, a company that could employ people, create employment and create jobs for people. Um, talented young journalists out there. So thank you once again and uh, I shall see you next Sunday. Good afternoon. <laughs>